You're watching South Front and today we're going to discuss the Russia-Ukraine military crisis in the Black Sea which happened uh, yesterday and I am today here with my colleague Brian Kauman and uh, we're going to be discussing it. You can ask um, any kind of questions regarding the topic and also uh, before we start and we, before we get into the details I just want to tell you that uh, uh, as you know, we are a crowdfunded project and we depend solely on your donations. So, we are going to prioritize uh, the comments which uh, we get from your sponsorship. So, you can just type in uh, on this link, you can type in your username, uh, your donation and your message. In the message, you can type in the question and we'll be more than glad to answer it. So, uh, without further ado, just want to say hi to Brian Kalman. And uh, today we're going to, to cover the a very interesting topic that is developing and is still even developing um, about the uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, incident that happened uh, yesterday. So, hi Brian. Hey Victor, uh, nice to talk to you again. I didn't think we were going to be uh, live stream again, seeing as we were just speaking uh, Saturday, but uh, unfortunately we had a, an incident in the Sea of Azov between uh, Russian Coast Guard vessels and Ukrainian naval patrol boats, and uh, here we are. So I think it's important enough, or it could be, uh, it could have ramifications that make it important enough for us to have a conversation uh, briefly about uh, what took place and kind of what's been uh, building here in the Sea of Azov, uh, this coming conflict or uh, this crisis point between Ukraine and Russia. Sure, and by the way, um, for all of you that are watching us right now live, uh, we are first going to go into what exactly happened. We are going to follow the chain of events, which you can actually see on southrun.org on the link that I have just opened. And um, let's let's just start out on what happened on the morning of the of November 25th. The Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB reported that three Ukrainian ships were heading to the Kerch Strait without permission from Russia to enter, thereby violating maritime law. Uh, with you, Brian, we're going to come a little bit more about maritime law uh, because you have way more experience when it comes to uh, the maritime laws and military um, issues. And getting back to it, furthermore, the Ukrainian naval group Illegally, illegally entered Russian territory waters of Crimea. Then the Ukrainian Navy claimed that, it, uh, that, the, transfer, that the transfer of ships consisting of two small armor boats, uh, Berdyansky Nikopo and the Yani Kapu tugboat, were, uh, was all planned. Uh, then, according to Ukraine, the Russian side was notified in advance that the ships were moving from Odessa through the Kirch Strait to Mariupol, and the Russian side said that it has received no notifications from the Ukrainian side. For the next several hours, the Russian side was attempting to solve the issue peacefully via uh, dip uh, military diplomatic channels, however, it failed to do this. Um, afterwards, uh, the important stuff is that on the evening of November 25th, the Russian side reported that the ships were detained and sent to the port of Kerch, and the FSB insisted that they were fo forced to open fire as the Ukrainian ships were illegally, uh, uh, illegally entered the Russian territorial waters and attempted illegal actions, and they were not responding to requests to stop and were performing dangerous maneuvers. Uh, then the Ukrainian ships were delivered to the port of Kerch, and um, we now have a little bit more information about the three um, Ukrainian soldiers that were uh, that received uh, some unlethal wounds, and uh, Rus Vesna um, actually showed us showed us uh, their photos. Uh, there was a reaction of the, uh, of course, there was a reaction. The FSB. Uh, said that uh, it's a deliberate provocation by Ukraine. Uh, Russia called an urgent meeting of the United Nations Security Council on November 26th. Um, when it comes to uh, Sergei Wovrov, the Russian Foreign Minister, said that it was definitely a provocation. Uh, we're going to discuss that with Brian. Um, Maria Zakharova, the, the spokesperson of the Foreign Ministry of, of Russia, also had, a, um, also had, her, um, had her say into this that uh, Ukraine is responding to bandit methods and the dear following a little bit more uh, of uh, what Saakashvili uh, has been doing. 
So, um, Brian, we're going to get into the details a little bit more, but what we saw, and from the Ukrainian side, of course, there was uh, Petro Poroshenko called the military council and proposed a 60-day uh, martial law. Uh, also, some of them, some of the Ukrainian officials called for, um, for all veterans and all military veterans to be ready for war. Um, they were calling for more... Um, sanctions and for more uh, involvement of NATO into the incident and the international reaction was of course a little bit more pro-Ukrainian as we're used to that in the past four or five years yet it wasn't as uh, as aggressive as it used to be so Brian um, what is your initial take on what happened yesterday well we're only uh, you know in the first 24 hours since this incident happened and you know all i've seen in western media and from uh statements made um from you know western uh, officials and ukrainian officials is the same mantra you know I'm, it's more proof of russian aggression towards ukraine but i think uh, very early on as we're starting to get some of the details of this incident coming out it, it obviously uh took place uh within the the 12 mile um, limit of Russian territorial uh, maritime territory extending from you know Russian uh, the Russian coastline. Uh, this incident took place uh, within that 12 mile limit, and um, as far as arrangements being made or communicated between Ukraine's navy and uh, Russian uh, authorities in, in Crimea, um, port traffic control and the navy, uh, there's no proof of that uh, so far. Um, although we have apparently what's been leaked by uh, Ukraine is uh, communication. I don't know if it was uh, non-encrypted and live over VHF channel between uh, Russian the Russian boats that responded. Um, that and in my opinion, from what I've seen, it, it basically supports the uh, story from the Russian side that um, that this. Issue happened within Russia's territorial waters, and the responding Coast Guard vessels were pretty much doing everything they could to turn the boats around, uh, the Ukrainian boats, uh, without coming into contact with them, without having any sort of exchange of uh, weaponry. Uh, it's important to note that all the vessels that were involved in this altercation, other than the Ukrainian ocean-going tugboat, which I believe wasn't armed, but... Most likely, the crew on board had small arms, but the uh, the Coast Guard boats responding from the Russian side. I think there was, from what I've reviewed from the video, there was at least one. I think uh, the NATO designation for the patrol boats are Rubin class, and that's got a, a 30 millimeter um, close in weapon system, and at least two uh, 12.7 millimeter machine guns on board. Um, this Don vessel, I'm, I'm not really sure what class of vessel that was, but uh, there's also at least one Sobol class patrol boat that responded that's in the videos, uh, which is a Russian Coast Guard boat, and that's equipped with a 14.5 millimeter gun and also a 30 millimeter grenade launcher. And then the, uh, the Gerza M boats, which were the two uh, Ukrainian gun boats, you know, they're also armed. Um, I believe they have a 30 millimeter automatic cannon and uh, machine gun and i think all these patrol boats also have man pads on board uh, just in case of uh, aerial attack so there was plenty of arms you know this could have gotten out of hand and we could have had a loss of life and you know these some of these boats could have been sunk and we would have had a much much larger uh um issue here international uh, issue that thank god level heads uh, prevailed on the part of the commanders of the Russian Coast Guard boats. You know, one one boat was rammed, the uh, ocean-going tug boat was rammed, but, you know, that ocean-going tug probably doesn't have a top speed over 9 or 10 knots. And from what I could see from the, the video, you know, the impact was not really uh, that bad. I mean, neither one of those vessels was going very fast. Um, so... You know, it could have been a lot worse. And as far as uh, international uh, law of the sea here, I'm not really sure. I would have to do some research, and I, I should probably do a quick uh, mm -hmm. write-up on this incident. But uh, way, as far as uh, the control right of transit… I'm showing right now a map which was leaked 
by the communication of the Ukrainian servicemen and it is showing that actually the Ukrainian Air Group were inside the 12 mile radius. Um, so it's another proof and it, it came from actually the Ukrainian communications that were leaked. So, um, so yeah, the, the, all of that happened and um, it's, uh, the, the coordinates that they stated uh, were just inside that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, 12 mile radius. It was actually 16.79 kilometers, which is nine miles away from the uh, Russian coast. So, yeah, that's um, pretty much wanted, beyond um, doubt at this just point. Just a little shout out here, uh, because what I just saw is that uh, with the nickname, the Crazy Puppet, just donated fifty dollars to our channel and told us to keep doing a great job. Thank you, you're amazing. Uh, thank you for all the support. That's why um, this project is is still independent because of people like you. So thank you, and we'll see you soon. Um, so again, g getting into the topic, um, it's an obvious provocation. I think that all of us can agree on this one. Um, and it doesn't happen just like that. Uh, after, and you've, you've served in the military. Uh, you've served in the military and you know very well what is actually the process when something like that happens. What does the Russian side first have to do and then what should be the response of the Ukrainians? What do you think? Well, it was obviously a pre-planned provocation, you know. Um, as far as how Russia responded, uh, I think they pretty much uh, did uh, the right thing. And they, they could have responded much more heavy-handedly. If you look at what uh, the U.S. Navy's done in the past uh, in the Straits of Hormuz um, with, you know, when they have issues with... Uh, Iranian uh, fast-moving uh, small patrol craft gunboats. Um, you know they've they've had a, a number of altercations over the years where vessels were engaged with uh, cannons and um, close-in defense weapons, and you know there were casualties. So uh, and boats were sunk. You know I, if let's just say taking another look at this this issue, you know what would happen if patrol boats from Cuba. Um, approach the Florida Keys or, you know, a, a heavily trafficked port like Miami and came within the 12-mile limit of the United States. I mean, they would have been the United States <laughs> wouldn't even allow that. those vessels to get close, you know, it, and you, you would, they would probably would have been sunk. So it's important to know when all this was going on, if you watch the video, you know, this is a heavily trafficked area. There's a lot of commercial uh, shipping traffic, and you can see – uh, tankers and bulkers and um, general cargo ships at anchor and also with transiting in the background, you know, all around this this incident. So, I mean, you could have also had casualties from, a, you know, an innocent bystander party. A commercial vessel could have been rammed by accident or, you know, caught, and, caught some uh, gunfire from one of these boats, you know, by accident. So very, very irresponsible uh, activity by the Ukrainians, this provocation. And what is what does usually happen when something like that occurs? So, what is the protocol, quote unquote, of um, the the quote unquote protocol which the Russians have to do, then the Ukrainians have to do? Is isn't it because I am not a military expert? I haven't served in the military. Um, nonetheless, the um, nonetheless anything uh, connected to uh, the maritime. Uh, when the Russians um, signal the Ukrainians that they're going into uh, waters that belong to Russia, uh, what should be the response of the Ukrainians? Do they have to pull back? Do they have to do any, uh, something else? Or um, what is the, the protocol, the military protocol into this? Well, these waters in this strait is, is, is Russian territory. Um, you know that they have control over the strait in a similar fashion to um, Turkey having control over the Dardanelles but I would say even more so in this case I, I am, I'm not uh, up on the uh, the actual uh, law that's been agreed to on you know governing transiting the strait but my guess would be that it, it would be uh, totally within Russia's 
purview to control any traffic in and out of the out of the strait. So obviously, when this this happened, you would have had uh, communication via VHF over open channels between the Russian bridge of at least uh, probably whoever took command of the you know small flotilla that responded uh, between the officer in command there and the the boats, the Ukrainian boats. They would have tried to contact them over open channels, uh, international safety channel, and um, the Ukrainian crews would be obligated to respond. Now, if they didn't, the Russian crew could have used other means, uh, flashing light, semaphore, uh, flags. There's a number of different ways to communicate at sea without voice uh, communication. I, I, I don't know. I'm not aware if that took place or not or you know what the uh, communications that actually took place between the, the crews, uh, the Russian – and Ukrainian crews, you know, what exactly the communication was. But the Ukrainians would have been obligated to follow the commands of the Russian Coast Guard because mm -hmm. they're transiting a strait controlled by Russia. It's their territorial waters. Yeah, and actually, um, if they refuse to do so, Joe, then the Russian. Sorry for interrupting Go ahead, Victor. because um, there is a question which is very much related to what, what you're saying right now, and it's uh, coming from Joe Howard and uh, quite some of the people. Uh, that are in the live chat right now and it's um high south from did ukraine breach uh bridge international law at sea so brian what do i you think, think it's beyond a shadow of a doubt that they did i don't think that's looking at you know where this took place it's it's not in doubt of course they did so you we know, cannot even there, there is no reason for defending the ukrainian side in this case I think this is a matter of, uh, you know, it's going to be a matter of domestic consumption. You know, you, you have Poroshenko is going to be, uh, he's got an election coming up, correct? Well, yeah, I saw a lot of people that were analyzing, yeah, Poroshenko has an election coming up in a few months, etc. But honestly, I don't really believe that it was that much about the election, especially knowing uh, how this regime is living up because the only uh, the only way this regime can actually justify what is going on internally in Ukraine is by Russian aggression by the so-called Russian aggression because what is happening in Ukraine and we can talk about this in details uh, internally uh, the fact that Ukraine is being turned into a failed state that the economy is in a total collapse that the people have no jobs that that actually the unemployment rates are skyrocketing right now, that the whole industry which Ukraine had was completely destroyed, that even one of the best producers of uh, transport aircraft like Antonov was totally liquidated and uh, um, what was left of it was sent to China. <laughs> yeah. So we can even discuss way much deeply into what Ukraine has been turned into after the Maidan and uh, it's not going to be nice for and it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be positive for the Ukrainian regime right now and uh, the only way they can justify what's happening right now internally is by Russian aggression the so-called imaginary Russian aggression there so this kind of a provocation and also we have to take it we have to take into into consideration that um, Ukraine is not really a sovereign state right now, and you know very well that the, U the U.S. senators and advisors and what's happening inside of the country is very much dictated from outside. Right? No, I would I would argue that Ukraine already is a failed state, and it would this government that's in power would collapse if it wasn't for outside support, mm -hmm. financial support, military support. Um, diplomatic support, you know, if that all goes away tomorrow, I don't see this this government uh, lasting very long. You know even, that even the state as a as a state is going to be correct. It's going to be turned into a Libya or something like that. Well, I think this this incident was an obvious provocation to once again portray Russia as the aggressor, and it it politically supports the government that's in power. And it also helps them uh, legitimize uh, and the, these calls for increasing support from the United States and NATO. And it, you know, it's also important to note that the uh, the Navy is going to be operating uh, 
a base in the Ukraine. It's uh, I think it's still under construction. Construction began in 2017. It's uh, they're they're coining it a maritime operations center. Um, it's built at. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but uh, Ochakov Naval Base in Ukraine. I'm not exactly sure where that is located on the coast, but um, that's something that uh, should be seen as a provocation also to Russia to have a, uh, a, a U.S. manned full-time military base, naval base along the uh, the coast there. You know, it's it just adds to the increasing... Uh, movement of nato and encircling russia closer and closer to their borders i mean the, the navy uh defines a maritime operations center as an operations level um warfare command and control organization where basically they can control uh different maritime capabilities uh including naval military operations um it also would operate as a, a support center for uh probably nato fleets and Ukrainian fleets have probably do a lot of naval training with uh, Ukrainian naval assets in conjunction with U.S. trainers. So, you know, that's, that's just another issue that's happening in that same area um, that's, that's increasing the likelihood of, uh, you know, future altercations. If you look at the, the size of the flotilla, if you want to call it that, of the <laughs> vessels that the Ukraine sent towards the Kerch Strait to Small patrol boats. I think they're about 50 tons in displacement. Really small boats and an ocean-going tugboat. It's not like this was some major armed fleet <laughs> that uh, you know. It, d- it doesn't really. Uh, I haven't heard the Ukrainian side explain why they were sending these vessels through the strait anyway. You know what? What? What would the be the importance of well, sending these small boats uh, to another to port Ukrainian port on the coast? I don't know. Well, it's obvious that, uh, that they needed something like that. By the way, there is a question coming from one of the people from the audience. And why wouldn't the elections be important for outside powers? Do you want to get a take on that, Brian? Or As, as far as who's going to be in power mm-hmm. in Kiev? Um, obviously, Poroshenko still has some political currency uh, with uh, the Western powers, the United States, uh, the UK, France, you know, the main members of NATO. So he's still, um, at least on the surface, in the media and th- what's portrayed out there is he's still their guy, you know. They're still supporting him. I haven't seen any any reporting that, that would say otherwise if there's, you know, a plan B, uh, a dictator number two <laughs> waiting in the wings that has more support from the West. I don't think so at I this point. I think the liberal media is portraying him as the person who is democ- democratizing Ukraine as, and that the, he's a fighter against corruption and he's fighting to oppress, uh, he's uh, uh, fighting against the oppressor Russia and he is um, the person that is going to bring Ukraine into... Uh, the European sphere of inf- uh, not a sphere of influence, but the European freedom. So, uh, of course, it's it seems laughable. I was just well, yeah, that's reports. how they betray him. You I know, he's just, just another corrupt oligarch. Few, but uh, weeks ago, about how uh, Ukraine is getting closer and closer to being a, uh, a real democratic state, and if and if Ukraine is going to be an example of a real democratic state, then we definitely need to. To rethink the concept of democracy. <laughs> well, yeah, they, like they, they put that out there. I think the only thing they're really looking at as far as, uh, you know, how successful the Ukraine is, is uh, how close it's come to interoperability with NATO. You know, there's, there's been a lot of a lot of troops in the National Guard and in the U- Army of the Ukraine have been trained by uh, trainers from the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom. And they're definitely... Uh, they're definitely increasing their skill set. You know, you're, <laughs> they're, they've come a, a long way since the days of uh, the conflict and their major defeats at the hands of the militias. Uh, they definitely have more equipment. They have better equipment uh, as far as uh, training. In tra- their training has increased. It's much better at the hands of Western trainers. So I think that's kind of the only way that the uh, United States and NATO is looking at the success as far as financially and uh, as a society as a whole, uh, I think we'd agree that 
Ukraine right now is a totally failed state. It's more fragmented than it, it, it has been since the Maidan, really. I mean, if, if Western support were to disappear tomorrow, I don't think it would take long before there was more internal conflict that would break this current government in Kiev. And, uh, you know, there's also other factors there. You know, you have the, uh, the more radical uh, right-wing neo-Nazi fascist elements that are proving to be an increasingly uh, a thorn in the side of the supposed legitimate government or what the West claims to be the more legitimate elements of the government. And you also have other uh, ethnic groups within uh, Ukraine as it exists today that are starting to exert their uh, their autonomy or the desire for a certain level of autonomy. And, uh, you know, those problems aren't just going to go away. Well, you're totally right, because um, we have to even address something there, that internally there's a big um, confrontation between the different oligarchs that, uh, that have different interests and that they're defending different interests. And even different, um, because you know very well that the United States, they are not very, um, when it comes to their policies, different people defend different things. <laughs> and uh, we were seeing while McCain was still alive, he was one of those people that were pushing uh, conflicts like that to happen. While there are people in the U.S. Uh, that are getting away from them. So... We have to also address that, that um, Ukraine has a big problem when it comes to the oligarchy and um, the people that uh, want to have a piece of the, uh, want to have a piece of the, of the whole pie. And um, what is your take on that? And I'm going to look uh, at the, ta at this time, I'm going to look at the comment section because we are seeing a lot of, a lot of comments going on right now. Well, uh, initially when they were, forming the the government in kiev you know there was a quite a few people in the running for um poroshenko's spot and a lot of them were oligarchs which poroshenko's cut from the same cloth so and you know th those oligarchs haven't gone away some of them were kind of put in a box and told to behave themselves and shut their mouth for a while but they're still there um you know there's also Elements like right sector and other groups that are there too, and you know they act independently, but they also act at the behest of allies. That you know, there's some allies tacit alliances with certain oligarchs, and that's been the way since the start. Um, you know, some of these oligarchs probably have their own own militias or private armies, really. Um, well, just have just like um, uh, just like some of them did, really did have some, and they were sending them against the people in Donbass. Like yeah. Kowalski, for example, I think Dnieper one was his one of his uh, private militaries. So yeah, I mean that that's still simmering under the surface. That hasn't gone away. There's still you know those oligarchs that that want their piece of the pie and feel like they don't have as big a piece of the pie as they deserve they're, they're still there waiting in the wings and you know like i said poroshenko's position is not exactly uh ironclad you know he's he's kind of in a precarious position and you know one of the reasons why is his poor leadership I and mean, look at the state of the country and you know it's uh like we said it's it's a failed state that's being propped up mostly from the outside um the imf and and also uh, governments of the United States and Britain, some other countries that have, you know, given uh, funding and, and uh, lines of credit basically to this failed regime just to keep it propped up. And I think really uh, time's not on their side. Um, I don't see uh, Ukraine's situation improving anytime soon, which is really sad because, uh, you know, I, I've met um, quite a few uh, really nice Ukrainian uh, officers on ships. You know, I work in the maritime industry now, and there's a lot of Eastern Europeans that uh, serve as officers in the Merchant Marine. And I've met quite a few really nice uh, chief mates that are from Ukraine. 
and uh, you know, from Odessa, Mariupol, some of these mm-hmm. places along the coast, and it's just uh, really sad, you know, to hear their stories of you know what they've been going through, their families are going through back home, and how how totally uh, just out of control the situation is, and um, you know, it, it's. It didn't have to be that way, you know. This is one of those things that uh, you know the West decided to unsettle and overthrow a government again, a democratically elected government in this case, in another country. And you know, look look what's uh, the outcomes been? Not a good one. Mm-hmm. Well, um, just before we move into some of the questions, I just saw that. Chocolate Robin Hood donated $67. Thank you so much. And his question is, can you also cover some of Syria, specifically recent allegations of chemical attacks? Um, Thank you. And we just released actually a war report as well as several um, overview articles on this thing on southfront.org. Tomorrow we'll be addressing a propaganda campaign over the things in a new war report and we will also discuss the situation in Syria in one of the next live streams uh, with Brian. I think that you agree on this one um, because we definitely have more expertise on this one. <laughs> and we've been calling yeah, well, Syria. To, uh, to address the uh, question there, um, you know, there's a, there was obviously, uh, at least at this early juncture, a, a chemical attack an incident of some some sort. I, I'm not sure what the uh, what type of chemicals were used. Probably a, another chlorine-based chemical. Um, it's interesting that this Ukrainian-Russian naval altercation happened right kind of right on the heels of what happened in Syria. You know, if it was a chemical attack perpetrated by the rebels again, I would have to add. You know, that wouldn't be convenient for. Uh, the Western media and, and, and the Western countries like the United States and, and Britain and France that keep pointing the finger at the uh, evil butcher Assad mm-hmm. as the perpetrator of all the chemical attacks Yeah, but in they Syria. were all silent. Like, nobody's talking about this. So. Yeah, right? Nobody's <laughs> talking about it. And this incident now is, you know, coming right, right on the heels of it, right after it kind of is uh, convenient for for them where they they won't have to talk about it because if you look at the news cycle at least the the western audience's uh, attention span you know that story's probably probably already dead and forgotten now that we have this one to focus on you know but we'll cover that brian will cover that in the next live stream we'll cover everything with um all of what's happening in syria um but right now i want to get into a very interesting and uh, a very interesting part. And Olaf is um, writing to us in accordance with Article 1738 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea and Article 2 of the Treaty between Ukraine and the Russian Federation um, on the cooperation in the use of the Azov Sea and the Kerch Strait. Uh, Ukrainian warships enjoy freedom. So what my colleagues did, and we were actually reading that before the live stream because uh, we knew that that's going to pop up. So just let me get the um, just let me get the convention and the article right up there in the link, and we will go to Article 19. Um, it was, I think, on the 31st page. Oops, no, that's the 37th. Um, just one second. Stay with me. Article 19. And what we have to read here. Passage is innocent as long as it is not pre- uh, prejudicial to peace, good order, or security coastal states. Such passage should take place in... Um, conformity with the convention and with all other rules of international law. Yet, we have a few things here which, in Article 19b, any exercise or practice with weapons of any kind when it comes to uh, not having an innocent passage, any act of propaganda aimed at affecting the defense or security of the coastal state, and any act aimed at interfering with any system of communication or any other facilities 
of installations of the coastal state. So obviously these ships were armed. Also these ships were um, in confrontation uh, with the with the law, and that's why they broken international law. I am not a lawyer. I am not someone with uh, education in law, but it's. <laughs> It's more than obvious, reading it, that in this chapter uh, we're seeing that Ukraine actually violated international law. And uh, Brian, I don't know if you can see it right now, um, but it's it's stated very clearly. And well, yeah. I think you, I think you summed it up pretty uh, clearly there. You know, these these vessels, the Ukrainian vessels, didn't meet the uh, requirements of innocent passage. You know, innocent passage of warships. On the high seas and within the territorial waters of states uh, is a you know well um, formulated concept, uh, a long running concept in international law that it actually you know precedes the the act as it's written there, the law as it's written there. You know it goes back a lot longer than that, but it was actually put into legal terms as you read it there. Um, but yeah, I mean. It, these uh, these vessels didn't meet the requirements of innocent passage in this case, and also they Ukraine is saying that they gave prior notification to Russia, but that would also be a requirement if these uh, naval vessels were transiting uh, the territorial waters of Russia. In this case, they would have to give prior notice and uh, you know receive basically communications back from Russia acknowledging it, and uh, they would have to meet the requirements of innocent passage where yeah. they were not armed and they weren't conducting any nefarious things and so forth and so forth so and the crimean bridge is basically that installation which the law is defending and by the way there is a and there is a question by word chuckles south front do you get state funding from any nation <laughs> so brian uh during this live stream we are receiving donations so i think that um, it's a bit funny. If we had gotten uh, any um, any funding from any any nation, whether it was as we're being allegedly um, allegedly pointed at Russia or any other nation, maybe we wouldn't have been doing all of that crowdfunding, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you think what we could do if we had uh, you know international some some government funding us. You know, I guess it's uh, when people say that, you know, I don't know if it's just uh, people trolling us or if uh, it just speaks uh, um, well as to the quality of the work that we put out. You know, I mean, you and I know better. I mean, yeah, we do some quality work, but, you know, behind the scenes, we <laughs> we have a lot of lot of issues, technical problems. And, you know, we're, we're all working day jobs and, you know, trying to take some time to uh, take some time out of our, our busy schedules and do live streams together like we're doing now and you know it's uh it's uh, it's always funny to me when i hear people critique us and wonder if we get funding from you know a state government and i'm assuming they're they're alluding to syria or russia or you know some enemy of the united states i don't know but uh you know that's my take on it but no we definitely don't receive any funding from uh mr putin or mr Assad or uh you know rouhani in iran or anything like that it's funny i saw one of our articles was reposted in uh, a website uh, called i think it's called the iranian and i was like oh god now we're gonna start getting called uh you know uh, facilitators of the iranian dictatorship and iranian apologists and that'll be the they'll just add it to the list of people we work for you know sure and um by the way they're asking why is Brian not writing negative news about Russia? Why are you new, why are you not criticizing Russia? I think when I I really don't write much about Russia to tell you the truth. I may have written a few analysis in the past. Uh, I think I wrote an analysis about uh, Russian helicopter development. Uh, I write about Russia a bit when I talk about what's going on in Syria. Um, I usually write mostly about uh, issues going on in the South China Sea and and the Middle East. So um, I just I guess when I look at 
When I look at all governments, I'm not a fan of government at all. I mean, I, th I happen to think that on the world stage, most governments act like mafias. You know, it's like a bunch of crime families. You know, in the UN, it's it's like a meeting of the goombas. They get together and, you know, figure out, you know, oh, this is my territory. This is your territory. Uh, somebody was doing something in his territory. Let's work this out like a bunch of good fellows, you know. But so I'm not a big fan of government, period. But I happen to say, or I happen to think that. And you look at uh, foreign policy in the world today. I think Russia's kind of got more of a uh, uh, a more down to earth, pragmatic foreign policy compared to the United States, my own country, and uh, the Gulf states that have been, you know, helping the United States unsettle the Middle East to, for their own benefits. And and NATO. I mean, um, I, I thought that when the Soviet Union dissolved and you know, the world was going to go through a period of peace and prosperity and we get back to doing, you know, what people normally want to do, you know, not not make war and have empires and, you know, all the other stuff that's happened since then. But, uh, you know, that wasn't the case. But so if uh, if I come off as pro-Russian, uh, I would just have to say that I kind of agree more, not 100 percent, but I agree more with Russian foreign policy than I do with the uh, U.S. foreign policy, without a doubt. And that's pretty much anywhere in the world you look at, whether it's in the Middle East with what was going on in Syria or in Libya or in the Ukraine, for sure. You know, those were all uh, horrible messes created by my government. And in some ways, in a lot of ways, uh, Russia's kind of helped uh, clear the, some, of, some of that mess up by just – going about things much more pragmatic way and uh you know so if i come off as pro-russian for that reason then i guess that would be true i, I agree with our mm -hmm. pragmatic foreign policy more than i do with that of the united states by the way <laughs> there is a uh, because people feel i mean some people uh, are a little bit ironic and i like that because right now we received a 50 door donation from a guy whose nickname is the government of the United States. So, <laughs> right now he just proved that we are funded by the U.S. government. Kidding, his, uh, his comment on, uh, on his donation is, just wanted you to read the name. Whoa, great job. Thank you, man. <laughs> Whoever you are, where, wherever you're from, that was funny. I mean, I, I was definitely... <laughs> he was definitely very funny when it comes to that. So, um, by the way, when it comes to us uh, being so pro-Russian in most of the people's eyes, um, well, we just covered a uh, we just covered and we had an analysis which was about an, a half an hour about the Russian maritime strategy and the problems in the Russian army right now. That's something that is not going to be covered by any mainstream media or any pro-Russian media. So, um, if you do think that we are so pro-Russian, then why are we covering so many of their issues? Um, we just wanna stay, uh, we just wanna stay open to different opinions. We just wanna stay open to hearing people with, uh, people analyzing uh, uh, different scenarios. So, that's why we're doing that. Anyway, getting back into the topic, what do you think is going to be the, the big picture of what happened yesterday? Uh, what is going to uh, do the Ukrainian government? They, uh, they just started a 60-day martial law, and what do you think are going to be the next action? Because they didn't get that much, uh, they didn't get that much of a good response from the, uh, from the Western governments. They probably, they probably expected a little bit more of uh, we are strongly condemning the Russian aggression, but they didn't get that. Uh, they got, there must be dialogue, there must be dialogue. Um, it wasn't that much pro-Ukrainian. What do you think is going to happen next? Well, I, I would say give it another 24 hours as far as uh, the Western response. I'd say give it a little bit more time. Um, but it all depends on, you know, how much information comes out about what actually happened. You know, how how well of a job Russia can do in, you know, portraying their side of the story, which we've talked about before, Victor. You know, Russia really has to uh, 
um, improve, you know, the, as far as the information war, they really have to improve, uh, you know, how they go about uh, putting their narrative and their, their view of events out, especially into the Western world where, you know, Western viewers can see it. Um, like, you know, they're, they're going to have to be a little bit more savvy um, in light of, you know, how how many assets, uh, you know, how how well funded and, and, and equipped the Western media is in, in order, you know, and how they can portray their own narrative, which, you know, a lot of times is 100 percent fabrication. But, <laughs> you know, they have the funding and the assets and the ability to, you know, portray a story however the hell they want to. And if there's not a, a viable counter narrative out there, then a lot of people end up swallowing it, you know, so. Uh, it, it'll depend on you know what, what kind of uh, factors, what kind of facts um, come out on what actually happened here, and how how well Russia is able to you know portray their their story well, of what I happened. I don't think that it's going to be that much into how how well Russia portrays it because you know for four years now we've been seeing, and actually it's almost five years now. Uh, Russia has been giving fact after fact after fact, and they still don't believe them. So I think that Ukraine will try, and the Ukrainian government will try to fuel the hysteria. They're going to try to say uh, more about. Um, they're just going to fuel more and more propaganda about the poor people of Ukraine, how they've been attacked by uh, by Russia, and they will try to not. Uh, address any of the facts they're just going to go with propaganda after propaganda after propaganda and i actually and i hope i'm mistaken but i think that there are going to be further provocations happening in the next few weeks and months well victor if if this incident ends up looking really bad for ukraine and how it actually was carried out that probably the most effective means of propaganda that the western mainstream media has is they just won't talk about it. And if they don't talk about it, most of the world doesn't hear about it. So it's basically – it goes from an, uh, an event that you could either use to uh, portray Russia as an aggressor to a non-event. That just never happened. And then you know, I'll just focus on something else. That, you know, That's another thing that I think that a lot of people forget about when it comes to the power of the mainstream media, that their ability to kill a story by just not covering it. Absolutely. And um, um, by the way, we have in South Rome so many members that are constantly repeating that Moscow is failing with its media campaign on a constant basis. All the time, we have it. And I am actually one of those people that believe that uh, that they're failing all the time because having all those facts, having the, having given the, the, the idea that NATO is building troops on their border all the time and are having the Baltic states being turned into a military base and having Ukraine being turned into a military base, now how can you even defend it? And people are still believing that Putin took down the Malaysian air, uh, aircraft and that Putin did that, Putin did that, and uh, the, the Russian media is not doing any of its job correctly because people are still believing that. You know, it's, it's crazy when you look at, at least from an American point of view, I, I look at, you know, the public opinion here and it's like, you know, you ask somebody what they think of Putin and immediately things come out there like, oh, he's a dictator, he's a strong man, you know, he's... He's uh, revitalizing the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. And at the same time, if you ask them right after that, well, you know, do you think we could, we would be better off if we had a leader like Putin? And they're like, oh, yeah, he's a great leader. He's done a lot of things for Russia. We should have, you know, we would be lucky to have a politician like him in government. So it's like, you know, I, it, it's, it's weird this uh, – this paradox, you know, in the the American public opinion, you know, in one in one instance, Putin's this horrible boogeyman, and in the other side of the coin, they wish they had a leader that was, you know, that strong and cared that much about his country here. So it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, 
and I'm loving hard on this one. Uh, right now, <laughs> just like a few minutes ago, we received another donation. A hundred dollars with a winking eye uh, and the name, the nickname of that guy is Russian Federation. <laughs> Brian, I think that I, I am I'm expecting right now, maybe the Syrian government or maybe personally Bashar al-Assad can donate something. Um, even I would be very glad if, the Bul- if someone with the nickname Bulgarian government donates. Zero problem with that. Uh, I've been very critical of the government from time to time. So maybe yes, fund this. I mean, we're a crowdfunded project. We will accept your donation, Russian Federation and uh, and the government of the U.S. <laughs> hey man, keep it coming. You know, we really appreciate the donations, and you know, I have to say it. Uh, adding some humor to the whole thing never hurts either. Yeah. You know, and I think that's kind of one thing that's uh, at least here in the U.S. is lacking currently. You know, you have such a polarization with on. U.S. society and people looking at politics and, you know, we just had our Thanksgiving holiday and, you know, a lot of people were, were, were nervous sitting down to dinner with relatives because they didn't want to talk about politics because, you know, people's views have become so, uh, you know, uh, just polarized. People can't even have a, a normal conversation, a constructive conversation, let alone have some, you know, humorous conversation. So, you know, I, I appreciate the, the influx of humor. You know, into this whole situation, and thank you for the donations. And um, you know, hey, I, if we get donations in today from Ecuador and Botswana and South Africa and Uruguay and any other government that wants to give us money, you know, hey, we'll put it to good use. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, um, because I just received a message from uh, our colleague Dmitri, and he is a part of the steering committee, who is constantly criticizing the approaches of the Russian bodies, especially in the diplomatic and propaganda fields. So, um, just another guy that is absolutely, I mean, we don't want to agree with, 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 with what they're doing. Um, by the way, uh, there is a question, it's not even a question, it's maybe a statement from a guy whose name is Broken Arrow 10, uh, uh, Broken Arrow, and he stated that 10 days ago, on November 16, 2018, there was a meeting in Washington, D.C. between the U.S. State Department and the Ukrainian counterpart, uh, counterparts, uh, and they met and they had a joint statement on the U.S.-Ukrainian strategic partnership, and uh, just so the, I just saw the, um, uh, the article, uh, the official release, and maybe they're pointing at the fact that maybe there was a U.S. Um, maybe it was planned uh, by both the U.S. and Ukrainian government. Maybe there's something like that. Just then they well, it's really that. hard to say. You know, I mean, things like that happen all the time, but it's you know, it's it's impossible to prove it. Yes, you know? sure. Um, I'm sure they talked about all kinds of things and. You know, there's obviously uh, a good deal of communication and coordination between the two governments. So, By the way, just want to read you because I just saw it. Uh, the United States condensed, and that was happening 10 days ago. Now, uh, the, the article came in the early November 17th. So, the United States condensed Russia's aggressive actions against international shipping transit, uh, transiting in the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov, and the Kerch Strait to Ukrainian ports. Both sides underscored that Russia's aggress- aggressive activities in the Sea of Azov have brought new security, economic, social, and environmental threats to the entire Azov Black Sea region. Well, isn't that something? That's why I, lo- that's why I like our audience, because they point out such things. And uh, where, where did you uh, find that? It's in the official uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine website. Wow. I'm just showing well, it I mean, right now to you, to the people from the live stream. Yeah, that's one of our, uh, you know, audience members that uh, is keeping up on things and, you know, informing us all about uh, possible... Uh, Pre-planning of this by the 
U.S. and Ukrainian governments. But yeah, I mean that's very uh, important to note. It's very uh, um, interesting to know that now. I hadn't seen that. Yeah, I, I didn't as well. Well, ah, we're coming to the point where I think that Brian, what is going to be, and that's how, that I think is going to be determining um, the situation and how it's going to develop. What is going to be the approach of the Trump administration? And I'm not saying Trump himself, but the whole administration uh, when it comes to Ukraine. Are they going to leave it to Russia? Are they going to make things worse? Or there's going to be some kind of a neutral approach, in your opinion? I think uh, Trump's administration is, is just going to continue the, the, the same uh, they're just going to do the same thing, basically, that uh, Obama's administration was doing. They're going to stay the course, and they're going to keep the Kiev government propped up, and they'll do whatever they can to keep them in power there, whether it's Poroshenko or they replace him with someone. Uh, they want to keep that lever of, uh, of force on uh, – or pressure, a lever of pressure on on Russia there in their own backyard. And um, – They'll just uh, – they'll, they'll drag that conflict out. I don't think they see uh, realistically any way that they're going to arrest Crimea away from Russia now at this point. I mean that's – I think uh, any thought of that would just be uh, uh, foolish. So they'll just keep the pressure on there and they'll – you know, like lo a little pinprick every other day. They're just going to keep that pressure there. I don't see uh, the status quo uh, that we've seen over the past few years changing there much. I don't think the Trump administration is going to up the ante there. I don't think uh, they see that as a, you know, a, a, a fight they could win as far as uh, if they want to bring the conflict back to a really hot stage again. Mm -hmm. I think that the Ukrainian army and, and the, the fragility of the, the system, the government they built over there could withstand – another offensive I, I just don't you know I, I think if the militias were to uh, suffer some defeats I, I don't think Russia is in a position to abandon them either so they're definitely I, not going to abandon them by the way uh, you're bringing me to a topic which we will probably discuss someday uh, and it's going to be very important because uh, right now nobody is that much talking about what's going what's happening internally in the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, because the internal situation there is not um, is not uh, very bright as well. After the death of Zaharchenko, after the killing, assassination of Zaharchenko, um, things have gotten worse, and we should we should pay attention to that as well. Uh, by the way, did you see the tweet by Kurt Volker, um, who is the special uh, who is the special representative for Ukrainian negotiations leading uh, the US efforts to achieving lasting peace in Ukraine and uh, his tweet was and I'm going to show it right now to our audience um, Russia rams U a Ukrainian vessel peacefully traveling towards the Ukrainian port Russia seizes ship and crew and then accuses Ukraine of provocation three question marks <laughs> Yeah, I saw that. I read that uh, tweet earlier today too. Uh, they're not going to. They're just won't stop. <laughs> I mean, it's um, it's hard to imagine how they come up with such creative things. <laughs> to, uh, yeah, creative. By the way, creative guys, uh, if you hear any external noise, sorry. I have my dog with me right now, and he's trying to come up and talk to you uh, in the live stream. So yeah, guys, apologies from me. Um, he's just trying to interpret, uh, to intervene, and he's probably a Russian hacker. Maybe Russia just sent it to me so that they can um, stop the live stream. Maybe he's a Russian agent. Oh, I, I just heard him there. My, uh, I got my two dogs here too, but they're actually being very well behaved. Maybe because they're not Russian hackers or agents. Yeah, they're they're French bulldogs, so they sleep a lot. Oh yeah, they're just crashed. They're just crashed out on the sofa right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, getting back to the topic, um, the bigger picture is not very nice 
in my opinion, mm, the situation in Ukraine cannot just uh, let it go just for like many, uh, for much more time because it's not going to be beneficial for neither Russia nor the U.S. to keep it like that. Because it's well, and, and, and then unfortunately, uh, you know, the people that suffer the most are the Ukrainians from all walks of life, from all sides. You know, they're the ones that are kind of the the pawns that are, you know, left to suffer. And nobody is actually paying attention to that, how the Ukrainians are suffering under this regime. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that's definitely a problem that's, that has to be addressed. By the way, um, just want to uh, just want to go through some of the comments that are going on right now in the live chat. And uh, um, there is a question from Yanis, uh, and he is asking. I'm asking myself, what will look like the Russian government and administration when Putin will be out of politics? What do you think? Wow, man, that's something I don't even want to think about to tell you the truth because. <laughs> You know, I can't remember uh, who said it, uh, which historical character, but, you know, they said no no great men are good men, right? Mm -hmm. But I have to say of all the heads of state that have been on the international stage over the past 20, 30 years, you know, one, one person that's really been, I would say, a, a statesman, love him or hate him or whatever, but he's a statesman. He's kind of like the only real statesman that exists right now that, you know, if you really think about heads of state or, uh, you know, uh, important members of governments on the world stage over the past 20, 30 years. I mean, Putin stands out as kind of uh, the person. Totally, totally in his own uh, class. You know, I mean, nobody even comes close. Um, you look what he's done for his country as far as, uh, you know. Improving the economy, the standard of living, um, improving everyone's, uh, you know, uh, life, and uh, bringing the country back from the brink of disaster. I mean, it's pretty amazing. You know, you you can agree with some of the things he did and not agree with others, but you know, in the in the grand scheme of things, uh, he's been like that that only real statesman in the world. I can't think of anybody on, on the same level as him. And we um, can even discuss that, that um, they're not even, because that's a problem, not having statesmen. And uh, if you think about it 50, 60 years ago, uh, the world had way bigger leaders than we have right now. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you can think France, of, uh, even, you, if, 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 even if you look at, if you look on the, some of the Western uh, leaders over, um, you know, the, the period of time since NATO was, uh, created and, and formulated as a, as a bulwark against uh, the Soviet Union, you know. And even right after World War II, you know, you look at some of the leaders, you get Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, Reagan, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, you know, I mean, those, those they were statesmen. Um, I can't think in modern times, looking at, at least from the United States, uh, you know, possibly with after Reagan, you know, he might have been the last true U.S. statesman of any merit. Um, so then you were and, turning, you know, he had his detractors, too. you were too. turning the Oval Office into another office, which was not a very nice. It's a it's a word that is, again, with, with starting with, oh, well, Bill Clinton doing something very different <laughs> from what he was supposed to be doing. By the way, there is a question from Mike. When is Southfront uh, going to launch an Android app? And by the way, we, we tried to start at developing, but we didn't have really the resources to do it right now. So um, if we get more donations, we might start doing that. But right now, knowing that we have less than 50% of what we should, we should have had um, at this time of the month, it's definitely going to be something that is not going to be a priority. Yet, maybe in the future we'll have it. There is a question from Mamouf. Uh, and sorry if I'm pronouncing anything uh, incorrectly, but there is Hello, Sovereign. I've been blocked from commenting on your channel, so I stopped making donations. Huh. Um, well, it's a free choice of anyone to support the project or not. 
Um, and my colleagues are telling me that we uh, that they've briefly checked and you are not blocked from commenting on our YouTube. We don't want to block people. I, I don't know a case in which we've blocked anyone uh, if they're constructive. I mean, there's some moderators sometimes and we ban like some accounts that are like bots that are just spamming, spamming, spamming. Uh, but if you have any opinion, just write an, an email to info at cellphone.org. Feel free to do it. We're more than open to answering you. So, so yeah, and I'll just go to the, I'll just go right now to the uh, questions. Uh, just let me see what we have from the people. Um, some people are actually, some people are actually commenting on stuff that's not even related to um, to the topic right now. There is a whole another discussion. Um, some people are saying that Putin has zero support in the Russian sane people. Some people are saying, oh, as we hope that Jurinovsky doesn't get the presidency. It's going to be very funny. Well, nobody's going to give the presidency, the presidency to Jurinovsky in Russia. Um, don't, don't count on this one. Um, and let me see something else. Um, there is something, and there is a comment from the crazy puppet. Uh, Putin even distanced himself from his political party when he ran for the last term of presidency. And I agree with this one. And he did it because he knows very well that this political party is a corrupt party that has nothing to do with the Russian interest. Putin very, know, very well knows that the party that is portraying itself as the presidential party it's just a bunch of people who have interest in stealing and, and having corruption in Russia. I don't know what's your take on this one, Brian, but definitely. Well, uh, well the, I, I a think you're right there. The party is, is just, a bunch of <laughs> just a bunch of people that want to steal parts of the, of the rich uh, Russian fields. Well, it sounds like uh, the party's in my country. Um, <laughs> I think Putin realizes that he doesn't need a party. You know, his the only people he needs to really uh, speak to and get the support of is the Russian people themselves. I think that's the base of his uh, his political power is the people. I think over overwhelmingly, and he realizes that. And uh, you know, I, I talk to different people uh, about uh, you know Trump here in this country, and you know how he's fighting his own government, he's fighting his own party. He's fighting people in his own administration to get things done that he wants to do. And uh, I think Trump needs to realize that pretty much his only uh, real political power uh, lies with the people as well. Uh, half of the people that voted that voted for him. You know, I mean, that's why he stays on Twitter and makes his kind of annoying outlandish comments every day. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to see a tweet from trump that actually sounded like it was geared to somebody that wasn't five years old um you know uh, yeah, had a higher intelligence level but that being said that's his uh that's his way to speak directly to the people without going through the uh the mouthpiece of control of the media and and the government so um but uh you know if if all leaders in the world could have the public support that Putin enjoys in Russia, you know, I mean, they sure would love to have that, but, you know, most, most leaders of political parties in the countries now, I mean, if you look at Macron Should in he? France and uh, Merkel now in Germany, I mean, how many, what percentage of the people actually support them now? I don't know how they even voted for him in the first place, but, you know, we all make mistakes, but at this point, I mean, their, their approval ratings are in the are in the sewer, you know. So, I think uh, Putin, you know, he doesn't really need a political party support. I think he's well past that. He has the support of the people overwhelmingly. He realizes it. Absolutely. But I would uh, just show something on Rus Vesna, which is interesting. That um, there is a video with SBU uh, 
uh, that the SBU coordinated the whole uh, the, the whole operation and that some of the detained uh, officers have talked about it in a video so I'm just going to show it you can see the you can see the link uh, maybe some of the people from our um, from um, from our team are going to post it in the live comments and we'll just show you the video uh, which was blocked here but I will open it yeah it's in Russian um, by the way, uh, just in the live comments, can you just tell me that uh, if you're hearing it? Yeah, I'm going to stop it and just wait to see if people are hearing it. Um, uh, I just stopped it, so can you tell me if you had heard it? Yes, we can hear it. Okay, thank you, Crazy Puppet. Mm. Член экипажа судна Никополь военно-морских сил Украины 23 числа получил задачу следовать, следовать маршрутом Одесса-Мариуполь через... So he's just saying that uh, they had received an order to, um, to follow the road to Mariupol Керченскую протоку А, through the carriage В пути исследования до города Мариуполь через Керченскую протоку мы зашли в территориальные воды Российской Федерации He's confirming that uh, they uh, went through the Russian territory waters. And that the Russian Coast Guard had warned them several times. That they are, uh, that they are breaking Russian law. And they were asking him to leave the Russian territory waters. I'm sorry, Victor, I can't, I can't see it here on my screen, but is that, uh, are they interviewing the they're crew members, the Ukrainian crew members? The, the crew members that were detained, and he's just explaining yeah. that, um, and I was just going to um, to translate that um, they were saying that uh, they had to leave the territory waters and wait for further confirmation until they're going to be um, uh, they're going to be allowed to to do it. Yeah. Uh, does, uh, does, does he say that uh, he was he was expressly ordered by uh, his own superiors to, to go through the an order. They had straight. received an order to, to follow that route. And now there is another guy that, are, that is being interviewed. He's clearly in a Ukrainian uniform, and I'm just going to start it right now. There is another minute going on. Я це за Сергій Андрійович. В п'ятницю утром вийшли в восьм утра з Одеси на. In on Friday at 8 a.m. Uh, they they just um, they left uh, Odessa. Uh, when they went through the Kerch Strait, uh, they went into Russian territory waters. После чего нам были поставлены команды остановиться и ну ожидать подальших команд перед тем как. I couldn't hear it properly. Надо остановиться и ну ожидать подальших команд. And they were made to stay there until another command was given to them. Перед тем как открыть огонь были замечены ракетницы зеленого цвета. Две. Мы на них обалевали. Дальше и шли, шли и к нам с нами уже связались. And the Russian ships were telling them to, to stop. And they were they were just um, the the commander um, told them to give up the to give up the ship. And there is another another uh, serviceman. З 22 ноября 2018 року за стою групи кораблів Воєнно-морських сил України рідо був сіроєнний капу Мбака Нікополі-Бердянськ осуществив переход через Керчинський пролів. Після пересічення Государственної Бердніси 
Российской Федерации визуально наблюдал корабли пограничной службы ФСБ Российской Федерации. Я запросы по установке по УКВ радиостанции игнорировал сознательно. Um, he is uh, he's saying that uh, they purposefully ignored the calls from the Russian Coastal Guard and FSB. Does he give a reason why? Uh, he just said that the, I'm just waiting for the, the, the next part. Just give me a second. Полковая радиостанция игнорировал сознательно. На момент перехода на борту находилось стрелковое оружие, а также пулеметы ДШК с боекомплектами. He said that um, he said that uh, they had weapons on the, the ships. Знал, что действия группировки кораблей военно-морских сил Украины в Херсонском проливе носят провокационный характер. And he said that uh, the, the whole operation was a provocation. Я, как должностное лицо, выполнял приказ и планировал осуществить переброску группировки кораблей из порта Одессы. And he said that um, uh, just a second again. Должностное лицо выполнял приказ и планировал осуществить. He did he understood the, the order and he had to do it. So just give me a second. I am not the sorry guys if the translation is not a hundred percent correct, but I just understand Russian. I don't really speak Russian that well. Um, just going to ask my colleagues here who know um, who know better Russian. Just going to ask them. Uh, one of the speaker and the the last one is the captain of the talk, uh, and the first one that we saw uh, was a warrant officer. So, uh, so yeah, guys. Uh, it seems like uh, after they were detained, uh, they got scared, and um, the Russians just filmed them with, uh, with them saying that um, what actually happened, and that it was a clear provocation. Uh, we will for sure have someone translated. We will for sure have because the video is just two minutes long. Uh, there is surely going to be in no time some translations in English. Um, so yeah, uh, it seems like uh, even the servicemen there, uh, they very well acknowledge that it was a planned provocation uh, and uh, they just, uh, that there was an order to have this provocation. Brian, I, I don't know what else to say. I don't know well, what else I'm, to say. I'm, I'm sure the I'm sure the Western mainstream media will say that uh, those crew members made those statements. Uh, they were coerced to make those statements because they were under duress. Yeah, yeah, probably there were like you know. 50 AK-47s pointed at them. <laughs> that that I mean that'll be the story if it's at all covered uh, in the Western mainstream media. If, if that video is even shown, uh, my guess is it probably won't be, or at least if it is. There won't be a translation, or there won't be audio, and uh, you know they'll use <laughs> sure. it to they say that uh, they'll just ignore it as as the person. Uh, I think it was the second one who was saying that they purposefully ignored the coast. The, the Western media is going to purposely ignore the video. <laughs> so yeah. By the way, we just have uh, an announcement. Ward Jacob Childs just donated sixty four point oh five dollars, and he said. Love you, love your work, Southron. Been following you for years. Thank you for your great work. Thank you for the great work. Uh, thank you for the great support. And there is a comment from the crazy puppet. Those crew members are Russian agents. <laughs> uh, I feel the irony here. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'd like to say something about the crew too. I mean. It you had to think, being one of those crew members, at least a commanding officer, that you were going on a fool's errand. I mean, obviously they knew what they were being thrown into. Um, it just, uh, I couldn't see being a commander of those boats, taking my men into a situation that could have very well turned out much, much worse than this. You know, it's, it's almost like it would have been a suicide mission if things got bad. So, uh, you know, I, I can't see doing that. He's basically followed an unlawful order to break the law and he could have had uh, some of the men under his command killed in the process. So, um, He's going to the comment section and the live chat if there's anything interesting going on there. Um, they're saying that it's suicide mission. U.S. media is not going to cover that. Uh, Ukraine is a punch dummy of Europe. Feel sorry for them. Mm, 
how do I donate with Bitcoin? Um, there is a way. I think there was a way to to uh, to donate with Bitcoin. Uh, my colleagues are going to answer you, Von Fer uh, Fer uh, Ferrer, uh, uh, just in a few moments. Mm. So yeah, oh, just let me see some other comments here. Cheryl Brandon saying that the UN security meeting was a bit of a shame, boss. They used the meeting to bash Russia as usual. Um, nothing new, just Russia. In my opinion, Russia just wanted to point out the fact that these kinds of provocations are not going to be left without any consequences. Um, yeah, I think that most of that. Um, most of what we covered was very important, Brian, and um, I think that having all of this in mind, we should uh, go for a wrap up if there are no, there, if there are not um, many more questions coming from the audience, um, because I think that we should have a bit more live streams uh, in the near future. Do you agree, Brian? Yeah, as far as this topic, I mean, for for what we know at this point, I think we you know pretty much covered everything uh, that we know, and it was good to actually have some um, late breaking information here as we were talking about things, and uh, you know we had some good comments and we had some great, really generous donations. So you know, thank you very much to those that donated, and you know to those that uh, come to the site regularly and you know enjoy what we're doing and support us. Um, and as far as live streams in the future, you know, we, you and I have talked about this quite a bit, and some of the other members of the team. I think it's a, I think it's a, a medium that we can use that people enjoy um, to, uh, you know, keep informing people about what's going on. And uh, it'd be great if we can get some more guest guest speakers uh, involved on the live streams I here in the immediate will. future as well. Will. So, by the way, uh, just breaking news from uh, Associated Press. Uh, Ukraine has officially imposed a martial law in the country. The Ukrainian parliament has voted to do it. So, uh, so yes, uh, the martial law is officially imposed in the in Ukraine. So there is going to be, as we as we are expecting, there are going to be further provocations. Um, and uh, guys, we'll keep you updated on everything that's going on. And if there's anything uh and if there's anything that's uh going to be happening in the next hours days um we'll have some breaking uh we'll have we'll have probably some breaking uh news and breaking uh, uh even maybe having a live stream if something big happens but i hope so that nothing like that happens <laughs> Brian, because that will mean that there is probably going to be a war and there is a question from the audience is, is this uh, provocation going to lead to a war and I hope that we conclude this live stream with that. Brian, what do you think? I don't think so. I don't think this one uh, incident uh, in itself, even if it escalates to something else, uh, I just don't see uh, a war at this time being in the uh, interests of the United States or Russia. I mean, maybe uh, the Poroshenko governmental We'll push it a little bit farther. You know, they, there was a, quite a bit of uh, um, artillery fire aimed at the Donetsk People's Republic coming from the Ukrainian side, uh, you know, right after this happened. So maybe maybe, maybe there'll be a further escalation uh, in the east um, against the uh, breakaway republics. Or maybe, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be another uh, provocation. But um, I think uh, Russia was very smart and kind of you know, nipping this in the bud quite, uh, you know, uh, quite vigilantly. You know, the response was immediate and, um, you know, they, this could have been a lot worse. I think they handled it well. And in, and in the way they handled it, I think that will discourage uh, the Ukrainians from doing anything similar here, at least in the immediate future. That's my take on it. But, you know, like I said, we'll, we'll have to see how the next 24 hours goes. But uh, 
I don't think this is going to lead to uh, a war or, in, in, you know, an increase in the uh, uh, heating up of the conflict again. I just don't see it happening right now. By the way, the crazy puppet just donated $85.95. And his comment is, can't make a comment to you guys, but have been watching your work for a while now. So here are my late contributions. Thank you, Crazy Puppet. I mean, I cannot thank you enough. I mean, today, uh, so many people have donated. Maybe more will follow up with you. Maybe more of them will do the same. But such projects, uh, such projects like ours, I mean, it's all about you and what you are doing. So, I mean, thank you. Um, there is... Uh, it's just amazing to see such people from all around the world donate uh, for projects like ours. Yeah, it's much appreciated. You know, we we can't stay uh, independent without uh, raising money from donations from the people that enjoy coming to the site to get a more truthful uh, uh, look at the world's uh, crises and what's really going on. You know, if you want a, an un, a more unbiased uh, commentary on the geopolitical situations in the world and what's going on in uh, some of the crisis areas like Syria and Ukraine. Um, we can't live without your donations. We live and die on your donations. So, you know, uh, this site uh, is your site and, um, you know, we couldn't do it without you. So we really appreciate the donations Absolutely. from, you know, a penny all the way up to, you know, whatever you're, you can give. It, it all helps. And I think we got a few more days uh, here before the end of the month, um, you know, trying to hit our $5,000 monthly amount, which uh, allows us to keep our, you know, current level of production. You know, we, we'd like to get more uh, so we could do a little bit more. But, uh, you know, we appreciate every every bit of money that everybody gives and all the support. You know, if you, if you can't donate, you know, just – Coming to the site, your viewership, comments, constructive criticism, uh, support in any way really helps us too. So much yeah, appreciated. Absolutely. And by the way, before uh, we end the live stream, I just want to make a little announcement that we had gotten in touch with um, the journalist Delana Gaitanjeva, who is a is now a friend of mine. She's she's a Bulgarian um, uh, she's a Bulgarian journalist, um, an investigative journalist. Um, and we will probably have her very soon on one of our live streams because she's doing an, agree, uh, an amazing uh, work and uh, what she's been investigating, uh, uh, you uh, will talk about her latest investigation, uh, investigation uh, that's not the correct word, <laughs> um, but um, uh, she had uh, revealed a lot of information about um, arms sales to rebels in Syria and now she has uh, another investigation on the biotech, uh, um, the, the biotech technologies and um, laboratories in Georgia and in Ukraine. So I think this is going to be very interesting for our audience. And uh, yeah, as a wrap up, just want to conclude um, that we understand that it was a provocation, and even the Ukrainian uh, officers. Acknowledge that. <laughs> we saw it in the video. Even they acknowledge that. And um, it's just a problem that it's a tendency that uh, the Ukrainian government in, in this regime is just going to have more and more provocations coming up. So, yeah, thank you, Brian, for joining us. Thank you to everyone who joined us today and to, to the people that donated. Special thanks for you. And I hope that I'm going to talk to you and hear from you very, very soon. In the meantime, uh, watch everything that's going on in cellphone.org. We're going to keep you updated on any developing news uh, in the world. So yeah, uh, thank you and have a great night.